Originating from Houston, Texas, the fastest growing city in the world. MJWJ, Global Radio Network. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farm. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. This is what we are faced with, and this is the reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we are coming to get our checks. And with that being said, this is Marlon Smith, your host and timekeeper for the hour, and you have stepped onto the yard wherein Black Greeks speak. So everyone get ready. Your payment is now due. Let's link up. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Black Greek Speak. I'm here, Marlon Smith, and we're excited to have you join us once again for another, I think, inspirational and very profound conversation about a subject that we need to really address. We, we're just coming out of a, a conversation about Obamacare and some other things, and I think one of the things that is getting lost in the conversation is about this idea of wealth and income. And I was thinking about that because a couple of weeks ago I received two emails uh, informing me that my yearly membership dues and chapter fees were due. And on, a month before that, I just paid for a national convention that took a little bit of money to attend here in Houston, Texas, and not to mention I was asked to put some money in for a foundation. And although I'm happy to, to give and when and where I can, and, and I feel grateful that giving doesn't fully or uh, – to profoundly exhaust my resources, I have to admit that I had to ask, where is all this money going? And how is it ultimately benefiting our communities? I, I mean, according to the Pew Institute and some other empirical uh, evidences that, are, that were going on, I, I was not thinking about that because, you know, some of this evidence that I was reading said that blacks have less upward mobility than whites. And in fact, in 2007, the sons and daughters of black middle class are about 45% of our black children are going to still end up near poor. And whereas, for instance, the average white family has accumulated about $113,000 of wealth, the typical black household has only accumulated about five thousand, just a little over $5,000 in wealth. And then the estimated median wealth of black ho households is like around $35,000, while white households estimated their parent median income at $150,000. And so thus these kind of statistics had me asking some real questions in this. Is this kind of like the best use of my money, paying these dues and attending these national conferences? Particularly, I wanted to know, was it really helping us in this wealth gap? And am I myself kind of putting myself in a situation that I'm not positioning myself to secure my own kind of wealth status. So this question and others kind of, you know, I said, well, let's talk about that on Black Greek Speak, that we're paying all this money to these organizations and we're asking for a, a kind of financial investment. But is that kind of investment uh, detrimental to ultimately what we are trying to do? So my real question for today is, why are we still dealing with the same kind of wealth conditions that Dr. King mentions in 1967 at the beginning of his Poor People's Campaign? So joining me today, linked up with me, in fact, are three people, one person. He's going to join us later, but uh, two persons right now to kind of help me address that is a realtor by the name of Latasha Pinson. Latasha, are you there? We're gonna I'm here. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? And also, Great, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for joining us. Listen, and I am so excited 
to have joining us is our own MJWJ Talk Radio Good News Morning Show host, Andrea Lynn Matthews. Hello, hello, good evening. Uh, you're here on the evening time. I know, I know. Oh, you, you, you're awake and vibrant. You know, y'all yes, talk. I am. Y'all, great, great, great. Yes. We, we know that you all start early in the morning. I am so excited. Listen, there's one of the two things I want to say because this is Black Greek Speak. Uh, sure. Both Latasha Pinson and Andrea are members of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. So as we say, <laughs> black Greeks do speak. And so we're excited that uh, that these two, two women have uh, decided to step into the ring with me and link up with me to talk about this very pertinent issue. And so, Andrea, I want to start with you. You're here with me. And I, I you know, I want to start with you because I want to... F- ask you, you're a scholar as I am, mm-hmm. right, and, and you are a scholar of black church studies, right? Correct. And well, so yeah. Religious studies. Religious studies. Mm-hmm. Religious studies. And um, I think the thing that is interesting to me is I find it ironic, and I wonder if you do too, I find it ironic and somewhat tragic mm-hmm. that the very issues that Dr. King mentioned in the, in the kind of the preview to the show that we talked about in his speech in 1967 it seems like these are the very same issues that we are talking about over 45 years later. Yeah, they are. Th- that's crazy to me. Well, it's crazy because the same situation is still existing and we never got an opportunity to implement the plan that Dr. King came up with. You say the same situation. What, uh, what does that mean, the well, same situation? Well, the bottom line is um, we're still right now dealing with voting rights issues. We're still dealing with um, Congress not participating and wanting to look at the issues that affect poor people in America. Um, It's still the, it's still an international issue. Our homeland for African Americans is Africa and they are definitely pillaging and also creating poverty at a rapid rate in our home country, um, which has a definite economic and social effect on African Americans everywhere throughout the diaspora. How does that explain that? I'm not quite sure how, I don't sure, I'm not sure if people can, can connect this kind of, uh, kind of deprivation that is going on in other areas of the diaspora and still connected to African-American wealth that is going on here in the United well, States. Well, and, and this is just, and, and for me, I, I look at it like this. If, um, America's a country of immigrants, besides for the Native American population. Okay. And so most of the immigrants came here voluntarily. Okay. African-Americans came here involuntarily. Um, And due to that involuntary status, we are disconnected from our homeland. And when you look at other immigrants who live in America, they have they still maintain some connection, even our Mexican, even with Mexico being right close, Cuba. um, If you look at throughout the all the immigrants that come in, Asians and everyone else, they send money back home and money gets sent to them. So when you look at the uh, little Italy's around the countries and you look at the um, all China the, chi- uh, the China, all of those, there's the, the difference to me, the only difference between them being economically successful, including the Mexican uh, and the Mexican population. I just bring that up because we're here in Texas and that's also the, one of the fastest growing populations. Um, my, to me, the only difference is the connection. They have a homeland and it seems in a colonial imperialist society, those who have a homeland have power. Those who don't, don't. And so, um, and so then what happens is there's resources. I mean, every resource that's known to the human planet comes from Africa. Um, we have got diamonds, gold, um, and yet our African citizens can't even have shelter or dealing with the same racial issues and same oppression issues um, or similar oppression issues that we are. And so, therefore, um, we're, we're, we're stuck all across the world. And that has a definite effect in the fastest growing and economic and greatest country in America. Well, let me try to see. Let me see if I can kind of connect what you're saying, and, and, and because I think that that's that's really still broad, right? So let me let me try to connect what I think I'm hearing out of what you're saying, and that is that when we talk about poverty, right, um, and wealth, one there's a difference between wealth. And I think people need to understand there's a difference between wealth and a difference between income because people will say, well, you know, and I, I hate this statement, but. They'll do things like, well, look at Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> look at Bill Cosby. And, 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 and we, have, we have people who are making six-figure salaries. And, and I think the, one of the things that I recognized, as I, particularly as I was preparing for this segment of the show, is that a lot of people confuse wealth and income. And I think I like to, to think about income as the amount of money that someone receives on a regular basis. You get a paycheck. 
you know, you get paid every week or every two weeks or every month or however you get that. So, so income is really this amount of money that someone really receives on a regular basis, while wealth is the length of time that persons or families, you know, however you kind of look at your, your, your social structure, uh, length of time that a person or family could maintain their current lifestyle without receiving compensation for performing additional work. Right. So how long can I live this lifestyle if this job played out? Right. That is that is a sense of kind of um, wealth, the difference between wealth and income. And I think sometimes we confuse those two. Of course we do. And so 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 for many of us, I think that's that's what we have to begin to address. Right. And so I'm going to bring Latasha into this because one of the places in where we start talking about wealth ownership for the African-American particularly is what you're talking about, and that is land ownership, the ability to talk about land ownership. And, Latasha, I'm, I'm talking to you because you're a realtor, and we don't have land. We don't, we don't own homes. What's the problem? Well, I, I'm glad you started this off exactly where I felt like, you know, the, the type of items that I would bring to the table. When we talk about wealth, when we talk about the African-American community, home ownership is a form of wealth building. Right. But we're also talking about a community who has the lowest home ownership rates among all of the communities. Our home ownership rate is 45%, whereas everyone else, uh, other than Hispanic community, which hovers around that same number, is well above that amount. You're non-Hispanic white, you're uh, Pacific Islander. So our first step, if we want to talk about building wealth is home ownership. But not only does that impact wealth, but it also impacts the value of our community. Right. And you know uh, what? I don't want to interrupt you. That's it. So really the question is, then how do we get to the home ownership? We're going to talk about that on the other side of this break. Hold on for one second. Thank you for joining us on Black We Speak. We'll join you right back in a few seconds. Thank you once again for joining us on Black Greek Speak. Listen, if you want to join us on the conversation, you can do so by dialing 800-970-8716, or you can also like us on Facebook at Black Greek Speak at <laughs> with Marlon Smith. We're, we're, we're still working on technical issues, everybody. I'm sorry I got distracted there a little bit. That was the intro, but we're going to work that out. <laughs> but I appreciate y'all playing that intro for us. Um, listen, um, we have on the line right now uh, Latasha Pinson. She's a realtor. And, Latasha, you were talking about this home ownership, and, and you were saying that we have to recognize that our greatest wealth really comes in home ownership, and we, outside of Latinos and Hispanic Americans, uh, are really lacking in home ownership. So what's the problem? Why won't we get a home? I, I don't understand. Help me understand this. Well, it goes back to what you were saying previously. It goes back to feeling like we're at home. It goes back to, you know, there are certain things that it takes to achieve home ownership. But so we don't have we don't have what it so, takes to achieve home ownership. I don't. I, I'm not saying no. We have what it takes, but our communities have not, as you got, we have not evolved to the place to where it's important because home ownership evolves from my parents own the home, so I mm. should own a home, and then the next generation should own a home. Well, if our parents and our grandparents didn't own their homes, then we don't know what it's like to have that sense of community, ah. to have that sense of giving back, to taking care of my home. We don't have those values instilled in us to go to the next level from generation to generation. Wow. So now we've got to figure out how to break that generational gap and, and our communities and our members of our communities need to understand the importance. One, first and foremost, it's good for our future generations. It is a value for our future generations to own a home. Our communities are better cared for as homeowners. And then the next is for our future generations to continue. Right, because it's amazing to me. Do you know, it amazes me the number of people who I know whose family members left them homes, but for whatever reason they lost those homes or gave those homes up. Well, listen, once again, this goes back to my opening statement about being an involuntary um, immigrant. See, if you come to America looking to establish a better life, Mm -hmm. then you are, you're you going to think of those things, right? Because you've left a country that was being oppressive to you, and you got on a boat or however you got here, and you came to America to make a home. When you have a generation of people who were brought here involuntarily, 
this isn't we th- this th- we, we don't have that concept right we were forced to be here so the neighborhoods we live in were either somebody the, the um, and, uh, and this is not anti-semitic but these are the old homes that that jews left when they got were able to integrate into the european you know american society we've always um um people who are stacked in um assisted his affordable living and in um poverty section eight all you don't own these things these things are given to you so you got to remember the um, we're looking at it from a cultural standpoint um you have a whole generation of people who never came here to make this home right so 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 therefore we're kind of lost and still wrestling with that so then that also kind of realizes that and it's and it may be subconscious and then on some level like um sarah's talking about if it is then you're not going to be engaged in trying to locate the house and then on top of that if your mother hasn't had a house and your father and your grandmother didn't have a house it just becomes a perpetual mindset so then poverty but so what you're saying is then at some level and what i hear latasha saying is that poverty in some ways is about the way we think about of course so it's a cultural dilemma. Of course. We don't see, just, and this is just the, one of the smallest things we can do to gain wealth. But, you know, if, if this is your background, if this is how, how you were taught, then we don't see the value in owning a home. What we may see is when the dishwasher breaks, I can call someone to fix it. Hmm. When, uh, when, the, the, when you get a citation, I can call someone to fix it. Well, when and, you think about home ownership, when you've lived in that mentality, it's I have to fix it. Let me let me I let me do something real quick. Let me do. So, I want to bring uh, joining us to the conversation is Marcus Barn. Marcus is a financial expert, uh, investment expert. Marcus, are you there? I can't hear him. So is he there? We're gonna we're gonna see if we can connect him on the phone again. Well, and can I just say this right yes. quick? And then also too, let me let me add to this cultural dynamic. When um, that that's in the minds and um, and I call them the DNA of of black people's um, social memory um, is when we did have black neighborhoods. If you go back in history, and we did have all black neighborhoods flourishing, black neighborhoods like Tulsa, for example, we were terrorized in this country. So every time that um, African Americans, and I, I shouldn't say every time, but the, in the times that African American people have come together as a collective and carved out a piece of land or a neighborhood for our own, we had um, KKK um, um, crosses burning in our yards. We had people dragged and de- decapitated and lynched. Um, we've we've been we've also had a complete terrorist attack on Tulsa in other in, in in other neighborhoods in Florida that we've looked at. So even when and, and that's in your and that's in our minds, right? When we do co- co- um, actually get together, purchase homes in this country, actually establish productive schools and neighborhoods when we did during segregation, we've been under a terrorist attack. Well, see, that's interesting. And Latasha, I want you to t- explain this to me because I I don't get this. I don't get this. Um there as I was doing this 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 the research on this study Right. There was two things that popped out to me that was very interesting. One of the things that they said was the reason as home ownership being important for for wealth development. They said one of the things that happens, particularly with black middle class, is that most of our homes that we buy are located in poor, close to or adjacent to poor black neighborhoods. And thus we are more subject to depreciated values of our home because of the way individuals may think about crime and development and businesses in home ownership. So here's this one thing that bothers me, right? That that kind of bothers me because there's this idea that somehow in order for us to move up in wealth, we have to kind of separate and segregate ourselves amongst ourselves, and that's problematic for me. But the other thing that I don't understand, these are two questions and maybe these are big questions, I don't understand why if someone loses their home down the street, why that affects my house on my block. Those two things I just don't, I don't systematically understand when it comes to wealth ownership. Because a lot of African Americans, since so much of our wealth was in our homes, that when we lost, when, when this, this, the, ho- the housing market bubble fell, we were the most impacted. So explain to me, who's, who's making these rules, and why does that work like that against us? You know that's two separate questions. <laughs> yes, I, I recognize that's two yeah, separate questions. Definitely, so definitely. Just t- tackle, tackle one of them for me. Tackle one of them. Okay, I'll tackle the, the second half of the question. Okay. Um, the second half of the question, and, let's, and, and we can look at this, and I'm really quoting um, from the National Association of Real Estate Brokers recently published a report, The State of Black Housing in America. So mm-hmm. 
I'm quoting directly. Some of what I'm saying is coming from that report. But during the subprime market, African Americans were the most people that participated in subprime loans. That's like terror. That's the so terror that I think we had the highest percentage of participating. I can hear Marcus talking. Can anyone else hear can't, him talking? Can't, can't, Marcus, is, is, I don't know. I can't hear him in the background, but we'll check on that. We'll have the engineer check on that. Okay, because he, he, he had a comment related to that. But as as so, we participated. We had the highest percentage of participation in subprime loans. So, if we had the highest participation in subprime loans, that means that our communities that we chose to move into are going to have the highest participation of foreclosure rates of depreciated value. So that is why it impacts not just your home, it not your home is also impacted by the foreclosure around the corner or the short sale around the corner because it's in your community. Hmm. And so you have to have you're gonna have that same impact just because you're still in your home and you're taking care of it there were five homes around you that foreclosed, and that depreciated your value. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that kind of leads back to your first question. Mm -hmm. It's not that we congregated in certain lower income neighborhoods, because I don't think that. I don't feel that we, but I feel that we were able to purchase the homes that were affordable to us at the time. I agree with that, Sarah, because, the, I mean, but once again, if we compare ourselves to other immigrants, what, what immigrant that lands in America doesn't do that? I mean, if you look at right now, first place that are the Asians and everyone, the um, Arabs, the Ethiopians, India, where do they land? They're in the black neighborhood. They, they, they develop stores. They charge us for overpriced f food, and they develop all the, um, all the gas stations, and then they move out to the suburbs. This is a part of the capitalist society that we did. The problem is with the differences that black people, in my opinion, haven't done is like the other immigrants. You buy the land in the black neighborhood, develop it, make money. And then, you know, like, for instance, I bought a house in Fort Worth that I, that I have that's paid for now. I bought it in a, what could be considered what you're talking about, a description of a low next to a low income deal. But I got a steal for it. I didn't have to go to the bank and get a loan. And so, and, and my house is paid for. I didn't have a 30-year mortgage. I got my house paid for in 15 years. So, so it, it depends on how you look at it. And if you know your history and you know how the economy and, and it works, you can, you can capitalize on it, which is what we live in, right? You know, there's, a, there's something that I want to talk about, and that is, that is the victimization that it sounds like we're talking about. And I want to make sure that we're not, saying, we're not examining ourselves through a lens of victims. But we'll talk about that on the other side of this break. break. Uh, once again, you can join us on the discussion at 800-970-8716. Black Greek Speak. Once again, thank you. This is Marlon Smith, and you've joined us here on Black Greek Speak. Once again, listen, if you want to join the conversation, feel free to dial 800 970 8716, or you can also like us on Facebook and join the thread there at Black Greek Speak with Marlon Smith. You know, Andre, there were some things that you all said that I want to make sure that I'm at least addressing, and that is I don't want us to take on the victimization. And maybe that's a personal kind of thing, right? Yeah. But it almost sounds like we're victims to a condition. No, I don't think we're victims. I think that we haven't totally assessed it, which is when you're talking about as Greek organizations, there's just some of the advantages that we've been able to take advantage of that we need to assess. Um, um, the, the, it's not a victimization. It's a reality. And we have to be understand that certain realities create certain behavior patterns and certain perceptions about life that impact our overall collective quality of life. And so when um, in, in the, the, the charge that we have in the di this day and age is that we can do something about it, just like you said with Martin Luther King, he attempted to do something about it. And since we haven't sat down and had these conversations that you're offering us today in this platform, we as a people haven't got together and collectively figured out a way to address this issue. But see, that's interesting. Martin Luther King made that statement and gave that speech and was developing that campaign in 1967. Over 40 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate that everybody's saying, you know, thank you for this platform. But I'm not, Martin did this over 40 years ago. But yeah, what but, happened? Well, what happened was, is that when Martin did it, be, once again, terror struck. 
they, they shot him down in Memphis, Tennessee. So what did that get you? They let him do the civil rights movement. He starts talking about poverty, and they kill him in front of all of our eyes to see. So, see, and you got to talk about when you, when you have a 400-year history of DNA terrorism on your mind, where every move you make, it has an impact on the brain psychologically, and I don't think we really wrestled with that. So what we did which is what you do is you develop a self-defense mechanism. We got busy um, becoming successful in sports, got busy becoming, you know, getting on television, getting in the media, getting in Hollywood, and then we acquired the wealth that we thought we missed out for the last X amount of years during Jim Crow. Then when we got the wealth, now the people who have the money, have the education, like Greeks, those of us who are at this part where we can actually learn this information, we've never come back together and wrestled with how, what are we going to do. See, we, Martin and them, they got together. We haven't, we're not together. And we're so, not together. So, no, we're not so, together. So, so, Latasha, here's a question. If, if home ownership is what we need and if it is about a sense of having a historical sense of psychological and real physical terrorism that we have had to face as a people. The real question becomes then how do we, if we need to break it, we, we all agree, we need to break it. What is the first step that we can do to begin to break that fear, that psychological and physical terrorism that we are suffering from to get this home? And, and let me say this, as, as a realtor, and, and you know, I, we were in one part of this conversation and now I'm so happy we're taking it to another part because I want everyone that's listening to know we have options you know we can think about this in terms of what do I need to do today and the first step is you got to get credit ready and you have to get financially ready credit ready and financially credit. ready explain to me credit let's, ready. Let's, I'm not trying to interrupt you but you know those 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 are big terms that some of us don't know what that means so explain to me what does it mean to get credit ready and then explain to me what does it mean to get financially ready. Do we got Marcus on the line yet? I was going to ask Marcus. Oh, there he is. I hear him. Credit there he ready, is. Credit ready. Okay, so we got to get credit ready, and we got. So let me do this. Let me. Let me. We got Marcus finally. Praise the good Lord. You know, we're gonna. Yes. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Yes. Yes. I, I would say I'm gonna haze you, but I'm on. I'm on. I'm can, on the air. I can. I can speak to that. Okay. I can speak to that. Okay. So um, help us. How how can we get credit ready and financial ready? Well, I think I think what the fundamental. The fundamental thing that we need to understand is that even in, in our society and in terms of wealth, uh, in a lot of respects, it's better to have good credit than it is to have money. Okay, because so how do I, I get good, good credit? credit? How do I get good credit? So if I have good credit, I can get the money. So it, that, that's where we have to, that's the first thing of understanding. It's understanding how great credit is. So because we don't understand that, that's how we ruin credit. Um, it's, it's psychological. So how do you get good credit? Now I have to throw it back at you. At what point are we starting? Well, because that, I think that, that's a relative think, scale. And it, it is a relative scale. And I'll say this. There are great opportunities. There are great agents. There are great lenders that will guide you down the path to where you need to get to get the credit worth. And I, I do agree with him when he says that great credit can sometimes be far better than money in the bank. Okay. What is a good credit score? I, I mean, people talk about a credit score. Tell me, what's a good credit score? Latasha, you say is anything get... over? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm no, sorry. no. no Mark... any, anything? Any, I strive to be over seven ten. Over seven one zero. So, yes. if, so if I can get um, a credit score, for... I don't. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to slow y'all down. You, you all know money better than all right. me. I, Go ahead. So you're saying? So Marcus, tell him. Tell them what minimums are. We know what grade is. Now, what are minimums for home purchase? Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, you, you need to save above 620. Really? In my estimation. 620. Yes. So, so you need to stay above 620 for minimums. You agree with that, Latasha? Is that where you're talking about, you know, 620 for minimum yes. credit score? And then, yes. then, but a great credit score is 710. Well, above 17. Well, let me, let me, let me try, because I, part of the conversation that you talked about when y'all talked about um, the uh, the subprime situation, mm -hmm. well, the reason, one of the reasons that, that it became so attractive to, to uh, African Americans is because of the debt eradication possibility that lied within a subprime situation. What so does that mean? What does that the, mean? What does that mean? Right, right, I'm giving it to you. All subprime loans were not bad loans. The problem was they didn't execute the plan when they were under the subprime loan. So if I already had debt and I used my equity in my home and, 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 and increased my rate 
you know, a subprime loan. I may have had a 6% rate, but now I have a 9% rate. But in exchange for that increase of rate, I paid off all of my debt, which freed up sometimes anywhere from 500 to 1,000 to almost 2,000 a month. But we weren't smart with that surplus that we had. So we didn't, what got us in debt in the first place, when we got out of debt, we still didn't fix the mentality. That's what we're not seeing. The reason I have bad credit is because I have bad mentality. So, so this goes back to, again, that to thinking about wealth as a psychological situation. It is not. Yes. It, it, and so we have to deal with that. So let, let, let's kind of put this in a stream of kind of where we move forward, because we're asking we're asking this through the concept of black Greek speak. Right. So my question then is divine nine. Marcus, you representing what organization are you? Are you a member of? Capital Alpha Psi. Capital Alpha Psi. And, and we have these two deltas. Crimson and cream, baby. Crimson and cream. Then we got all this crimson and cream yeah. love. And I'm going to ask Latasha okay. this. Latasha, if this is the case, what is the responsibility of these organizations? What should we be asking these organizations then to do as a collective group? Because Andrea has made the statement. We can't, we can't just talk about this as an individual, right, that what King did was he created a campaign. He exactly. created a movement. Yeah. He, he brought collective groups. Well, we got the collective. We got, we got Alpha Phi Alpha and Alpha Kappa Alpha and Delta Sigma Theta and Kappa Alpha Psi. All these organizations, we got the Divine Nine, right? What is it these organizations can do to begin to address this first issue with credit? What do we do? What can we do? Can I, can I, can I, can I take the first step, first step at it? Sure. sure. Okay. I, I, I believe it's even, even larger than that. I believe these Greek organizations as the Divine Nine need, because we, we exist in community in a lot of different ways, and we're way more powerful than even at the top level than even what we think. So as the Divine Nine, I think we can hold a lot of these banks accountable um, on a lot of these on a lot of their lending practices and that sort of thing. And then if they don't want to do right, then we have a lot of control. We have a lot of money within the Divine Nine to, to, to uh, uh, wave a wand, so to speak, and, and really start getting into the minds of these bank presidents and that sort of thing. Here's what I mean. Because the circulation of money isn't all of that, isn't, isn't all that prevalent in the African American community. Uh, it's not even one. It's like 0. 0.8. Whereas in some of the other ways, it, it, it goes around six times before it leaves the community. Okay. So we're talking in, in, in those kinds of terms. So even if you even if you use that, okay, that's that's big that's big radical language. I'm 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 okay with radical language, but but if you're saying that these divine nine, in your words, can hold these banks accountable, I'm trying to figure out how do we hold these banks accountable when the government, Congress, couldn't even hold them accountable. How how do we do that? Well, Con I think there's a, a, a two step. There's there's two steps that could 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 happen. Okay. It's like Marcus said, we are large enough and impactful enough. There are programs out there that are supposed to make home ownership affordable, that is supposed to make business loans and small business loans affordable and, and easier to attain. So, yes, there is opportunity collectively as a whole that that's something. But we also, I think that in our community, we also need to collectively work together, working with our communities and teaching them what it is that they need to do to a start achieving not just home ownership, but wealth overall. You know, taking care of education, um, family building, just everything that it takes to essentially get to wealth. We, because that's what all of our sororities and fraternities are built on, it's built on working in our community. So I, I think there's two. There's the grassroots effort, and then there's also the big effort that could possibly take place. So, and, and we'll meet in the middle, and we'll start to grow and prosper well, as and, a community. And for me, I mean, my also thing is also um, creating cultural pride in what we are. First of all, we need to stop saying that we live in the ghetto and in the hood. Because if you look at the re gentrification going on in the United States, we own in the hood, in yes. the ghetto, yes. we hold the prime property real estate in yes. America across every major city in the state in the United States. So, see, we're not in the ghetto. And so, so I mean, and so, and, and that's the first thing that we can do. And I think Greeks can actually help with that education piece. See, and then, um, or can we? 
because a lot of the folks in the Greeks have moved out to the suburbs. Well, maybe that's a problem. We're in the suburbs. We're all in the lands. That's what somebody said. We're in. We're all in I these did. lands, right? Then, and, and we have to be, begin to address that. Listen. I, we got people who want to join the conversation, and you can do so at dialing 800-970-8716. You can also like us on Facebook at Black Greek Speak with Marlon Smith. We got a lot more to talk about We're on the other side of this break. Join us in a few minutes as we just leave and come right back. We're so glad that you could join us back here. Listen, if you want to I join if you can join the convers, if you want to, you can join the conversation at eight hundred nine seven zero eight seven one six. We we are still talking about this between the breaks, y'all. So you all are, you all are getting some of the interruptions of our conversation. These people are just radically trying to figure out how we can change this. Look, I I want to go back to because it seems to me that the core of this conversation about wealth within the African American community. As as Latasha, mm-hmm. you were talking about Marcus, as you were talking about, and Andres, you were trying to uh, advocate for, is really about a conscious thing, right? It's about the way we start to think about wealth, and I think about that because I look at people who have these rims on their t- on their car that cost more than the car. I'm like, why in the world are you? You know, we end up buying shoes, right? That are really the cost of mortgages. And and that's really kind of that is a conscious thing, and and we so we talk about well, okay, well, we need to begin to do some things. Here's a, here's a question that I'm wondering because you say we have to, we all have to get together. Here's what I don't understand, and and you all can help me with this. And Marcus, you you said something about we can work at the banks. Latasha, you talked about that we need to we can. There's some grassroots things that we can do. Here's a question that I don't get. We have these we have these frat houses, these sorority houses. Explain to me why the Divine Nine doesn't buy up all this property in these neighborhoods. Hello. Why, what can we do to get them to in- incentivize them to buy the property? Is it they can't do it, or mm-hmm. what? What is keeping us from doing well, uh, it? I think I think what, I, what we were discussing on the break. I think because we still exist, but we're still separated, you know, at the core. Um, so we, we we get together at various functions, but we're not together necessarily at the table. And I think starting a bank would actually be the start of what you are talking about. Then start garnering assets for this bank that we're all a part of. See, that's interesting. Because I know I know that I know that for some of the fraternity organizations they started credit unions, but but some of them weren't able to last. That so so right. you know well, well, and, and, and there are, I mean, the um, as I did on my show, on the Feel Good Morning show, we talked about it. Um, the Congressional Black Caucus, they just announced that they're going to open up some black banks and that they're actually working together. Um, so the idea, the, the issue is, and I did it, I did this show on, on Tuesday about uh, Rockefeller Institute executive summary. We're being studied by the Rockefeller Institute. And one of the things, the number one thing that keeps us from changing our status is that we don't work together. The, the black community has, and this has been documented, and you can look it up. Um, that and they did a study on like 14 cities across the United States and the number one thing is we don't work together. We have all the helping systems that any culture could actually have with between the low, the moderate and the high economic systems and social systems but as a people we have not figured out how to connect those helping systems to protect um, and produce change. Unlike what Martin Luther King that's what we don't do that Martin Luther King was a genius at. And we have not, and we have not been able to, to mock or to duplicate his brilliance. But obviously, I mean, it, there, there's something that there's something in that that whole conversation, right? The discourse that is going on about black wealth and and the disparity gap that we that we have here, and because we teach, I mean. I, you know, I don't want to beat up on. You know, we're all a part of the divine nine, right? And I, I so, so I don't want to. I don't want to sound like we're throwing them into the street to be run over by a tractor trailer, right? I, I, but we teach about unity, right? That is the core. We talk about brotherhood and sisterhood. There is something then that is missing that we haven't in a hundred years. I keep on saying this. A hundred years. I hear one nine oh six, one nine oh eight. One more time, right? Uh, that is, we have been here over a hundred years. There is something that we are missing that we have not understood collectively that we need to come in. And, you know, my, my grandmother said this. She said one of the reasons that she is so inactive with so many things, she said because she's tired of going to all these national conventions. And I'm not going to give because, you know, we make, but, and giving all these different other hotels and convention centers right. our money. I, I mean, I mean, I hear I hear organizations brag, you know, 
about how much money they brought to the city, you know, because of their convention. And my question is, how much of that money that you brought to the city you know, I don't want to call Delta out, but y'all, y'all were just in D.C. Mm-hmm. How, how much of that money in D.C. went to our neighborhoods and benefited our neighborhoods? Well, when you're talking about D.C., you know, that's that's an. I mean, you also got to look, and this is what I'm trying to say. I don't think that everybody has to do the exact same thing. See, that's okay. what we do wrong. Okay. See, what, what people need to look at, instead of asking Delta Sigma Theta sorority what, what we're doing about it, look at what we're doing. See, I think we need to turn the question around. Oh, that's a good what, point. What, why, okay. why, why don't we look at what Delta Sigma Theta sorority and in, the, in, in each organization is doing and then co- com- put together a comprehensive plan? Ah. It, because what you're good at is what you're good at. We're passionate about right. the things that we do. And you could tell, and our record, which is why we did what we did <laughs> at our hundred year uh, celebration. Let me just clarify that. Okay, okay you see what I'm saying? Because we good at what we do. Okay, we good so at what we do. and so we fabulous at what we do. That's what I'm saying. So what? The, so what the divine eight need to do, what, what the divine eight need to do is a divine eight need to look at what Delta Sigma Theta is doing, and Delta Sigma Theta needs to look at what the Divine Eight are doing, and we need to come up with a way. Kappa does certain things very, very well. Omegas do certain things very, very well. And so, therefore, if we would ask, what, and we would stay in our lanes, that we could have our individuality, and we would actually assess. We all went to college. Let's assess the information, and then let's put a comprehensive plan. If, and and, it's, and, and it, I, I like to say, I use this all the time, one of the most effective plans in our history that didn't really result in a whole bunch of terrorism of the people who led it was the Underground Railroad Movement. Don't ask Delta Sigma Theta to take you from poverty all the way to the White House, but Delta Sigma Theta can take you from poverty to your first home. Now, when we get into the first home, what Kappa going to do? Kappa going to take you from your first home, like Marcus is saying, and make you wealthy with stocks and bonds. Then after that, maybe the American is we'll make sure you do some international things and then the alphas will make you do it and then AKs well I don't know what they're going to do no I'm just playing you're wrong for that we love the alpha gap alphas well they can throw a good party you know, we can party together d- don't think that no they're doing some great things but I'm I do teasing, but, uh, but there is some but, but but that's a great conversation can I, can I, can I interject can I interject yes brother yes um, I, I, I think at the end of the day um, to, to get uh, to, to kind of bring everything back to where, where you're trying to go on, on the wealth piece um there, in, in any situation, if you look at why we don't own homes, look at why um, uh, people were, were wheeled homes and then lost homes, look at why we got in debt, look at why we're going after the shoes, the rims, whatever the fashionable stuff is to be seen and, and to create some sort of artificial pride, it all stems from just a lack of discipline and don't understand how discipline actually is the best teacher of the rich. They know hmm. Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is in a three-bedroom, two-bath house. Your house, my house, is bigger than Warren Buffett. My house is bigger than what yours? <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah, I need to downsize well, this. And, and I think you, that... You, you understand I, what I'm saying? Is there's a message in that. Well, and... and, and and, and coming from my point of view, which is, which is a real estate point of view, realtor point of view, just what Marcus said is it's also, one, we are the lowest income earners. I mean, that's the statistic. We earn the least amount of income amount hmm. of all groups. So that means that when we do get into the mindset of wealth building, purchasing a home, we need to understand that there's an amount that you qualify for, and it's okay. It is certainly okay, but it's a start, and you need to start somewhere before you get to where you want to be. Yeah, flip the house, flip it, flip it. That, that's a that's a good that's a good idea. Is that we need to talk about? We just need to have a place where we can say we are going to start, and if we can have that conversation, I, then I think we can I. I think we'll have a great place to go. We're going to come back on the other side. Listen, you can join the conversation at 800-970-8716 or like us on Facebook at Black Greek Speak with Marlon Smith. We'll be back in one moment. Once again, welcome back to Black Greek Speak with Marlon Smith. We have joined, uh, linked up with me. We have Marcus Barnum, Latasha Pinson, and our own good news, good news, more, good, more, good, feel good, feel good. Thank morning you. show feel with good. Darian Ward and Andrea Lynn. That's it. That's, That's it. it. Thank you for joining us. But we're, we're getting ready to, um, 
get ready to wrap up. But, Marcus, you had a final statement that you wanted to give about where we need to start. You said we just need to start. Divine Nine, let me say this. Divine Nine, we need to start. Just start. Give me a starting point. Marcus, give us a starting point. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go the long way, so I'm gonna be very quick. Okay. Um, let me talk about me real quick because I think people need to hear my story. And you don't have to make a lot of money to be real wealthy. Let me say that again. You don't have to make a lot of money to be real wealthy. You just have to know what to do with the money that you get. So I, I started at Allstate Insurance. You, you know that. I never made over forty thousand dollars. I started at twenty-eight thousand um, dollars. But when I left there after six years, I had a hundred thousand dollars in my first home. I started in an apartment. That means I took care of my credit. I paid my bills on time. Mm-hmm. Um, so my, my first home cost $130,000. I then went to AmeriCorps Mortgage Company and was a VP and rose through the ranks there. Um, and then we went, um, we, we went out of business throughout the, the, the housing crunch and all of that. Um, while being unemployed, I moved into a uh, larger house, twice the cost and twice the size, being unemployed, no income coming in because I know how to pay my bills and I look strong on paper. We have to understand, don't look strong in your pocket, look strong on paper. That's what everybody evaluates. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so we got to start by looking strong on paper. Latasha, what about you? What do you say? Where do we start for you? Where do you where, where's the starting point for you? Well, and I want to I I bring to the table this. Okay. You may not be ready today for home ownership, and that's okay. But if you get with the right people, such as myself, the right lenders, we can put you on the plan to success. We can put you on the correct plan to success. The thing is, you have to start as an individual. You have to listen to the information that is being shared with you. You have to execute that plan. And it's and it's and it's not. Sometimes it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Sometimes it will take time. Hmm. But if you do the steps that are provided for you, we can get you there. Okay. Right? And then my and 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 I would like to follow that is for the divine nine. I'm challenging a conf a, a meeting. The people who this is a passion for you, and you're on the groundwork right now, trying to make this in your organization, in the in the in the divine nine. You are doing something about it, whether on a personal or collective level, with an organization that you're working. We need to meet. We need to meet across the nation. We don't have to be in the same location. Doesn't cost any money. There's Skype. So we can get together and we need to devise a way and maybe it comes up with black Greek speak where we actually sit up in here and we actually sit down and say who in our community, who in the divine nine, who is doing what we need, to, what needs to be done or who's already taken the initiative to start. See, because that's the point that we're not paying. There are people starting all over. We just don't know who they are. And then once we, once we, once we identify those people who are doing effective, positive things in the in our neighborhoods, then let's organize and put together a comprehensive plan that we can actually do and take to our nationals and make a difference. Right. Well, for those of you who are listening to Marcus's other conversation, he's on the phone with. He's on the phone, so he's trying to do two different things at one yeah, time. Yeah, we can hear. We can hear him. Tell him, tell him, Marcus. We we can hear you on the uh, in your second conversation. Mute us, brother, if you if you need to. So. We we can make sure that we get the we get the right information, but but I, I agree with you that and 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 I think we need to be careful to say that these organizations are not are not doing anything right. That we need to be careful uh, that 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 we are not doing uh, saying that we're not doing anything. We are doing some things, and I know that our national presidents, in fact, met with the uh, Congressional Black Caucus. What we need to be able to do is figure out how we can continue to build on that. And we have the model. I mean, w- this is a beautiful thing. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Martin Luther King, like you said in the open segment of this show, Martin Luther King was talking about the exact same thing. He already implemented a plan. As a divine nine, we can't pick up with Martin Luther King started and carry the torch. I mean, I mean, we, we, and, and, and it's already worked out. He told you how to land on Congress. He told you how to get the people involved. He told you what to do. Matter of fact, we saw it with Occupy on Wall Street. They used his strategy to get national attention to an issue. The tea packers, everybody's used Martin Luther King's strategies, but his own people. What's, I mean, I'm just saying, what's wrong with that? Well, we will get there. We will get there. Okay, 47, you just said yourself. Over 47 years. Uh, okay. But I, I think the thing that we have to say, and I think the thing that we have to do, is we have to recognize the power of, of that. 
we have to recognize the power of this kind of collective unity. And I think for, for a long period of time, and this is, this is just my own assessment, I've said this before, and I will say it one last time, is that our organizations, for the most part, lent themselves to 19th century black intellectual thought. If people listen to black Greek speak, don't get anything else. They're going to get this one point is that our founders in 1906, 1908, 1911, 1913, 1920, 1922, those individuals lent themselves to black intellectual thought that talked about racial uplift through individual achievement, and we did that. And we didn't get back to what we started to recognize in King in 1967 was now we need to now that we got some individual merit achievement we need to have some collective achievement and we left we we dropped off right there and now we need to now that we got some Barbara Jordans and some Arthur Ashes and some Martin Luther Kings and now that we got these kind of individual achievements we have to now have this collective achievement I want to have one last wrap up for Latasha Latasha what do you have to say to that I, I agree. Um, I, it starts in our communities. It starts with our organizations doing what we set out to do in our communities. And, and as a member of Delta Sigma Theta, we do so much in our communities, but there are opportunities to participate with other members of the Divine Knot. That's the because key. Because as Andrea said, someone else may be better at something else. Well, so if we put all our efforts together then we're going to have a greater impact and a greater outcome. That's why we say in, over here on Black Greek Speak, we got to link up. Listen, I so appreciate Andrea for joining us. Latasha, I appreciate you. And Marcus, I appreciate you for joining us. Listen, I always leave us with this one statement that everybody, nobody this in, in this world, everybody, is in the same position, and we have to remember that everyone can't do everything, but if some, if everyone did something, then everything really would get done. Thank you once again for joining us on Black Greek Speak. Link up with us again on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Time. Until then, take care of each other.